to Notable Nobels, a podcast about the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine. My name is Harrison Doolin. I am a PhD candidate at the University of California, Riverside, and I will be your host for this web series. The purpose of this series is to trace key advancements made in the biological and medical sciences over the past 120 years or so, and we're using the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine as a guide. Now, every career has its highest prize. Athletes get Olympic gold medals, chefs get Michelin stars, actors get Oscars, musicians get Grammys, writers get Pulitzers, and scientists get Nobel Prizes. It is the most prestigious award a scientist can receive, and it marks discoveries that have made a profound impact on our understanding of human biology and ability to treat diseases. Today we will be examining the 1928 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, which was awarded to Charles Jules Henri Nicole. The Nobel Committee at the Karolinska Institute chose to give Nicole the award, quote, for his work on typhus, unquote. We will be going over some of the history of typhus epidemics, the work Nicole did to show lice transmit typhus, and end by going over the biology and life cycle of rickettsia, the bacteria that causes typhus. But first, a little bit about the recipient's background. Charles Nicole was born in September 1866 in Rouen, France. His father was a physician at a local hospital, and he supported the education of his children so they could follow in his footsteps. Nicole studied medicine at the famous Pasteur Institute in Paris, earning his M.D. in 1893. The Pasteur Institute had been founded only six years prior to Nicole's graduation by Louis Pasteur, one of the world's leading experts in medical bacteriology. Pasteur was one of the main advocates of the germ theory of disease, the notion that specific microorganisms were the cause of specific diseases. Pasteur recruited many talented scientists to the Institute to study microorganisms and their link to disease. Nicole's time at the Pasteur Institute gave him access to the new world of microbes and their ability to cause disease. Nicole returned to Rouen after completing his medical degree, taking a position as the director of a local bacteriology laboratory. Then in 1903, he moved to Tunisia, which was then under French colonial rule. In Tunisia, he was appointed the director of the Pasteur Institute's Tunis branch. He would remain in that position for the next 33 years, and it was in Tunisia that he would make his Nobel Prize winning discovery about typhus. So many of you listening are probably asking yourselves, what the heck is typhus? And that's not surprising. The disease is basically unheard of in the developed world nowadays. Its elimination was due in large part to the work of Nicole, more on that in a minute, but before it became scarce, typhus was a common disease that plagued humans for centuries. The name typhus comes from the Greek word typhos, which means smoky or hazy, which is a reference to the confused fevers seen in people suffering from typhus. In addition to fever, people who caught typhus would develop headaches and a rash that covered most of their body. As the disease worsened, they would become delirious, and in about 20% of cases, the disease was fatal. Typhus was also closely associated with war. In fact, most of the history of typhus epidemics surrounds war, and the disease earned the nickname war fever. Hans Zissner, a 20th century professor at Harvard Medical School, has the following quote regarding the relationship between war and typhus. Quote, Soldiers have rarely won wars. They more often mop up after the barrage of epidemics. And typhus, with its brothers and sisters plague, cholera, typhoid, dysentery, has decided more campaigns than Caesar, Hannibal, Napoleon, and all the inspectors general of history. Unquote. He's totally right about that. The great military conflicts of history go hand in hand with outbreaks of disease. Typhus played a particularly grim role in the failed invasion of Russia by Napoleon in 1812. Napoleon had set out with an army half a million strong to fight the Russians, but only about 
30,000 of them would return, and typhus would claim the lives of over 100,000 of those French soldiers, more than were killed by the Russians. But even in the absence of wars, typhus was pretty common, especially during winter, and seasonal outbreaks of the disease occurred in many parts of the world. And one place where typhus was fairly common was Tunis, where Charles Nicole was working. Typhus was a seasonal problem in Tunisia, especially in rural areas, and in slums, and in prisons. The disease was very widespread and very deadly. Nicole commented that, quote, Most of the doctors in the Tunisian administration, especially those in country districts, contracted typhus, and approximately one-third of them died from it, unquote. So every winter, the hospitals would be overrun with patients, every bed was taken, and people would be lining up in the street outside the hospital, waiting to be admitted. In the face of all that sickness and death, Nicole was driven to do something about it. That being said, his discovery was made almost by accident. He made a very simple observation, an observation that required no medical training whatsoever, an observation that really anybody could have made. What he noticed was that typhus patients could spread the disease up until the point of their admittance to the hospital. Typhus patients would spread the disease to their family members, to the doctors who would visit them, even to the administrative staff at the hospital who would check them in and wash their clothes. But once they were checked into the hospital and given a bath and a clean pair of clothes, they never gave the disease to the inpatient doctors and nurses who took care of them. Nicole then asked himself what the explanation could be for this observation, and he hypothesized that the contagious agent must be associated with the sick person's skin and clothing. This led him to suspect lice. Nicole hypothesized that body lice were spreading the disease from person to person, and that the soap and water removed the lice along with the pathogen from the person's skin, which stopped the spread of the disease. Now, this was only a hypothesis at this point, a pretty good hypothesis based on the observations, but Nicole needed experimental evidence for his idea. He decided to test his idea in monkeys. In biology research, it is very common to use animals as models for human diseases, and monkeys are more genetically similar to humans than other lab animals like mice and rats, so monkeys make good test subjects, though they are harder and more expensive to maintain. Nicole injected a monkey with infected blood, and after the monkey developed a fever, he gave the monkey lice. The lice were allowed to bite the monkey, then Nicole took the lice and transferred them to healthy monkeys. And the result was that all the monkeys bit by the infected lice got sick. Nicole now had his experimental evidence that showed lice could spread typhus, and he published his results in 1909. The news spread fast, and the effect was huge. Within three years, typhus, once a regular problem in Tunisia, had been eliminated from all the major cities in the country, and other countries were seeing the same results. The Nobel Committee, recognizing the significance of the discovery, awarded Nicole the Nobel Prize for his finding. So how exactly did Nicole's discovery lead to the control of typhus? Well, by recognizing the louse as the carrier of the disease, it gave people a target to prevent typhus infections. Since the disease is spread by lice, if you stop the lice, you stop the spread of the disease. It was plain that a simple wash and clean set of clothes would be enough to control the disease, but modern standards of hygiene in those days, 120 years ago, were still far below where they are today. Delousing stations were set up at many institutions where crowding was common, like military barracks and prisons. People and their clothes would be washed before they entered their quarters, and that drastically reduced the spread of lice and typhus. In the 1940s, governments began using insecticides like DDT to further reduce the spread of typhus and other insect-borne diseases, often setting up shower stations where people would get sprayed down with these chemicals. 
These interventions that targeted the Laos helped save millions and millions of lives in the 20th century. It's a pretty amazing feat, to be honest. But what about the pathogen itself? Nicole had identified the Laos as the agent that transmitted the disease, but what was the pathogen the Laos was spreading from person to person? So we're now going to take some time to talk about the microorganism Rickettsia proezechiae, the bacteria that causes typhus. I'm first going to describe the pathophysiology of the disease and then describe how the bacteria was discovered. So first, let's go over how Rickettsia caused disease. Rickettsia proezechiae, which I will just call Rickettsia for the rest of this episode, is chiefly a pathogen of body lice and humans. It rarely infects other animals and is only spread by body lice, not by the more common head lice your toddler might pick up at preschool. The body louse picks up the bacteria from the blood meal it takes from a sick person. The rickettsia infects the gut of the louse where it begins to replicate. Over time, the infected louse moves from a sick person to a healthy person. The infected louse will then defecate millions and millions of infectious bacteria on the person's clothes and skin and also bites the person, breaking through the skin barrier to get more blood. The infected louse will eventually turn red and die from the rickettsia infection, but not for several weeks, during which time it has the opportunity to infect more people. The defecated bacteria brought there by the louse can then enter into the bloodstream of the person covered in lice. The bacteria can enter the bloodstream either through the site where the louse bit the person or through other cuts and abrasions. Once inside the bloodstream, the bacteria will infect endothelial cells that line the person's blood vessels. Inside the infected cells, the bacteria replicate and eventually burst open the endothelial cell, releasing all the progeny bacteria, and those new bacteria are then free to travel throughout the bloodstream to infect more endothelial cells that line the blood vessels. This infection of the blood vessels and the immune responses that go along with it results in widespread damage to the blood vessels of the circulatory system. The infected individual's blood vessels then begin to leak, and this results in fluid building up in their other organs and also results in less blood circulation. This means less oxygen gets delivered to the person's organs. Without oxygen delivery, the person's organs begin to fail, and widespread organ failure leads to death. However, the bacteria wants to jump ship before it gets to that point, so the bacteria will circulate in the blood and eventually get picked up when another healthy louse comes along and takes a blood meal. This results in the infection of a new louse and the cycle starts all over again. So that's the infection cycle of Rickettsia bacteria. Now let's go over how the bacteria was discovered. This is pretty interesting. So Nicole lived in what has been called the golden age of medical bacteriology. The last couple decades of the 19th century and the first few decades of the 20th century saw an explosion of discoveries where most of the major disease-causing bacteria were identified, including diseases like tuberculosis, cholera, tetanus, diphtheria, and many, many other diseases. Rickettsia was also identified during this time period, but it was identified rather later in time compared to the other diseases. You see, people weren't sure if typhus was caused by a bacterium or a virus. People began their search for the microbe that causes typhus in the blood of sick patients. Since they knew that the blood was infectious, it made sense to look for the pathogen in the blood. Now, other bacterial pathogens could be grown and cultivated in the lab on petri dishes, but nobody was successful in growing bacteria from the blood of typhus patients on petri dishes. Additionally, when people looked at blood from sick patients under the microscope, they were unable to see any bacteria, even though they knew the blood was infectious. So this led people to assume that the microbe might be a virus, something too small to see under the microscope. 
Many people, including Nicole, had this view. However, there was a test scientists could use to distinguish bacteria from viruses. What they did was they would take the blood from a sick person and they would pass it through a filter, sort of, you know, like a coffee filter. The filter contained holes too small for bacteria to pass through, but smaller pathogens like viruses could pass through the holes and be collected. The scientist would then collect the filtrate and inject it into an animal to see if it could cause disease. If the infectious agent could pass through the filter, it was named an ultra-filterable agent, which was the original term people used for a virus. Now, an American scientist named Howard Ricketts, for whom Rickettsia is named, performed the filtration experiment with typhus, and the result was that the Rickettsia did not pass through the filter, meaning it was not an ultra-filterable agent. It was not a virus. So, that was puzzling, right? On the one hand, the infectious agent of typhus was bigger than a virus, but on the other hand, it wasn't visible under the microscope and no one could culture it in the lab. Well, the microscopy issue was solved when a special stain was used that colored the rickettsia so that scientists could see it under the microscope. They saw that it was a true bacterium, a small one, but definitely bigger than a virus, and it had a cell membrane and a cell wall containing peptidoglycan, just like other bacteria. So, true bacteria, but although it was a bacteria, rickettsia seemed to behave rather like a virus. Scientists realized that like viruses, rickettsia bacteria are unable to replicate on their own. They can only grow and divide inside the cells they infect. They are what we call an obligate intracellular pathogen. So this explained why nobody had been able to grow the bacteria on petri dishes. More recently, the full genome of rickettsia has been sequenced, so we know the full DNA sequence of the bacteria. And rickettsia has a very small genome for a bacterium. It's only about one million nucleotides long. For comparison, the largest virus that we know of, the Mimi virus, has a genome 1.2 million nucleotides long. A closer look at the genome of rickettsia showed that it lacks a lot of genes required to make some of the basic building blocks of life. Genes like lipid synthesis, carbohydrate metabolism, and synthesis of certain amino acids. Because rickettsia lacks these genes, it is totally dependent on the host cell for growth and replication. It is an obligate intracellular pathogen. Now, given all this knowledge of the rickettsia bacteria, the next question is, well, how can we combat it, right? We knew from Nicole that there was a way to prevent the disease from being transmitted by targeting the louse, but what about strategies for targeting the pathogen itself? Well, people were quick to realize that Nicole's discovery provided a way to grow up rickettsia in the lab for use in a vaccine. In 1930, a scientist named Rudolf Weigel in Poland cultured lice infected with the bacteria, then ground up the lice to use as a vaccine. The vaccine worked, but growing enough of the pathogen in the lice was a dangerous and time-consuming process not suitable for large-scale vaccine production. Then, in 1938, an American scientist named Cox discovered rickettsia could be grown in chicken eggs, which allowed for increased vaccine production. The Cox vaccine was used widely by the military in the United States and other countries during World War II, and the U.S. military continued to use the vaccine up until the late 1960s. However, the vaccine was never administered for public use in the United States, and that was because one of the most important discoveries in modern medicine came about, antibiotics. So the development of insecticides that targeted the louse and the development of antibiotics to combat rickettsia directly meant typhus cases dropped dramatically. The method of delousing people to control typhus helped eliminate the disease from most developed countries, and the disease is now very rare, and the few people in developed countries who do get typhus are easily cured with antibiotics. 
Now, although typhus is rare in first world countries, it has the potential to reemerge, particularly in poor, war torn countries. For example, as recently as the mid 1990s, people fleeing civil war in Burundi lived in refugee camps with very poor sanitation conditions, which resulted in a typhus outbreak that infected at least 50,000 people. So, typhus, though greatly reduced, still continues to impact the poorest people on our planet. It's worth noting that there are many people on the planet who still live in unsanitary conditions without access to soap, water, and antibiotics. And it's also worth thinking about how we can take steps to get these people the products they need. So that concludes this episode of Notable Nobels. This episode was recorded on February 25th, 2021. I want to thank Digital Mind Productions for providing the music. Since it's the middle of winter, I thought for next time on Notable Nobles, we could talk about one scientist's investigation into the role of sunlight in human health. Well, who was that scientist? Tune in next time to find out. Thanks so much for listening. See you then.